Blade Runner 2049 is one of the most important films made this century because the movie asks some incredibly important questions about modern society and the resultant loneliness, with Blade Runner giving us an eerily realistic portrayal of how loneliness is created and enforced by the modern world. Across the main character's journey, he battles with the same forces that shape our current society. And at the end of the movie, you'll realize just how deep the message truly is. So to unlock these truths, we need to jump right into the movie. The film begins with a short backstory which sets up the context of the movie. We are introduced to the idea of man-made human called replicants. They can have engineered physical and mental attributes far more advanced than evolutionary humans. But the corporation that created them couldn't control them and collapsed after large amounts of replicants went rogue and rebelled. This upheaval, combined with near complete ecological collapse, has left the world as a barren wasteland, being saved only by advancements in artificial farming spearheaded by a man called Wallace, a mysterious technocrat who has since created replicants that lack free will. The older replicants that still have free will and survive the violent rebellions are now hunted by Blade Runners. Blade Runners are police officers whose job it is to kill or retire rogue replicants. And the main character of this story is Kay. A Blade Runner who is a newer model of a replicant, and we're introduced to him in the first scene, as he flies in a lone car above a vast grey complex, and as he lands we see another man in a bright hazmat suit who pulls some worms out of a dark liquid. Kay invites himself into the other man's house, where they begin a tense conversation as it's subtly revealed that Kay is a Blade Runner and knows the farmer is a replicant. When the encounter descends into its inevitably violent conclusion, the farmer's superhuman abilities are obvious as he throws the other man through a wall. Kay soon gets the upper hand and scans the farmer's eye with a machine confirming he's a replicant, but as soon as he's about to execute the farmer, he says something strange. Because you've never seen a mirror. Although this is just a normal day on the job for the Blade Runner, the farmer's comment is still odd. Investigating further, Kay finds a perfect yellow flower amongst the ash and dirt of the farm, and realizes it's a marker. He scans the ground below it, revealing a box, but he can't investigate it yet, as he needs to leave to outrun a massive storm. And as he leaves, we realize just how dystopian this world truly is, in all of its monolithic enormity. The world of Blade Runner 2049 is just so oppressive. It evokes a sense of isolation and depression. And despite seeming utterly alien, everything in Blade Runner does does almost feel familiar. That same feeling of enormity, like you're just a single grain of sand in a massive desert, is just as present in all the mega cities that we live in today. And it's this very real atmosphere, this detached western alienation that we feel in these giant dystopian mega cities, is what gives the movie so much weight. It shows the ever present feeling of loneliness that western mega cities feel. But in this vast and uncaring world, there's enormous room for a journey of truth and discovery. At first, it seems impossible to find meaning here, especially with technology complicating and slowing him down. So K powers through although the results of his journey are far from what you'd expect. In fact, Kay's journey is incredibly similar to the journey that everybody is forced to make today. And by studying Kay's journey, we can therefore learn a lot more about who we are and our place in society. But there's a lot of things standing in Kay's way, and they're the same things that stifle people's authentic desires and needs today. One of the ways that Blade Runner draws a very big parallel to real life is through its architecture. The buildings and landscapes in Blade Runner are manifestly horrid. Even seeing them briefly gives you a feeling of impenetrable loneliness and insignificance. And whilst they may be be hauntingly beautiful from afar, living around these sorts of buildings is horrifying. That's why people living in mega cities today are all too familiar with this feeling, the sense of dread that these concrete monstrosities permeate. Just the presence of modern architecture is enough to give a place an oppressive and grey atmosphere. This is true of nearly all of today's mega cities and only compounds the awful mental effect of scratching out a living in the modern world. The bleak unnaturalness of this architecture is just incompatible with a happy fulfilling life. And that's why in Blade Runner, this brutalist architecture is matched by the brutal lives of the people people that inhabit it. And we'll see what I mean throughout the rest of the film, because in the next scene we learn that the Blade Runner's name is Officer KD6, or just K. He lives a very harsh life of violence, which is only made worse by the constant harassment K gets for being a replicant. They occupy a much lower social class than organic humans, acting as slaves or tools for naturally born humans. K is forced into complete subservience to his boss, following her every command to the letter. Are you telling me no? I wasn't aware there was an option then. Attaboy. If he shows signs of deviancy like emotion, he'll get retired just like the farmer. This is then enforced through a strange hypnotic test that measures his emotional reactions. Kay takes this test after the job is done, but after a nervously long process, he gets through fine and is allowed to go home. And even though he doesn't really know it yet, this is the first part of Kay's journey towards truth. And weirdly enough, this links in with the colour scheme in Blade Runner, because the key scenes in this film are yellow, and this is often seen as the colour of truth and the right path, whereas red only leads Kay astray. The yellow flower is the first part of Kay's heroic journey. This is his 
his call to adventure, and is all a part of the concept of the hero's journey. Now this concept was first laid out in full by the psychologist Joseph Campbell, and it's made up of three overall stages which each have their own different parts. First, the hero is given the call to adventure, whether it's figurative or literal. They refuse the call at first until they're given aid by a mysterious figure and learn more about the lie they're living in, but an overwhelming threat forces them out of their usual world and into the unknown. Across this journey, the hero is forced to make hard decisions and sacrifices, but during this time, they also learn the meaning behind their life, whether it's because they're the mythical chosen one or they have something unique that the world needs. Regardless, this is the path to following your destiny and eventually reaching truth and enlightenment, which the hero can use to defeat the main threat and find their place in the world. And for Kay, this all begins with the yellow flower, but it's the next realization that will really set the ball rolling. But to understand this next realization, we need to understand the lifestyle of Kay. Kay is a representation of the average lonely man in society. He lives in a dingy apartment in poverty, and when he comes home, we hear his girlfriend shouting from another room. Okay. whose name is later revealed as Joy. But Joy isn't just a normal girlfriend. She is simply sentient AI, with her only physical representation existing as a hologram. She's not even real. There is no real deep connection. She's a program. But Kay uses this AI to mask the pain of his loneliness. Loneliness is a key theme in Blade Runner, and the character of Joy makes an incredibly accurate parallel with the world today. You see, Joy plays the role of a supportive housewife, but we can't help but notice that she's literally tied to the house, and later on we also learn that she's programmed to love Kay, most likely unconditionally. In fact, Kay has complete control over her, down to her features, voice, and even her eye colour. Designed to be the perfect girlfriend, she has no choice but to fulfil her purpose, and even though Kay does feel some artificial love for her, it's still incredibly limited. And we get the sense that Kay knows all of this, he's all too aware of his bleak surroundings, when he's asked later about her and he calls her very realistic. Although it's clear that this romance doesn't have any real basis. There was no dance of courtship or finding out what the other person thinks and feels. Instead it's completely safe, cold and sterile. Joy lacks the ability to even consider not loving Kay and this makes the whole thing so boring and bleak, lacking any of the deeper levels that gives a relationship any meaning in the first place. It's almost like an analogy for adult entertainment, offering you the perfect woman, the perfect body, the perfect face, complete quick gratification, all in exchange of a horrible lonely long life. But even without consider Considering the question of free will, Joy serves as a reflection of our society as well. Her role is to keep Kay complacent and smooth out his awful life. She is to anchor him down, to make him never fulfil his purpose, and to keep the ever-present loneliness and horribleness of Kay's world from getting to him. But at its core, it's all inauthentic and imperfect. Technology is fulfilling a role that just can't be replaced, which is why it seems so clear that Joy's holographic visage is just a few steps beyond the adult entertainment and girlfriend experiences that so many men pay for. Parasocial relationships people have with Twitch streamers, Instagram stars, and OnlyFans models. Sure, Joy may seem real, but she is a commodification. There's nothing there, she doesn't exist. It's a soulless husk of a human being, with Kay simply chasing a phantom, only making him more and more lonely. And the same process is happening right now today, and the consequences for both men and women in modern society are horrific. More and more men and women go without any meaningful connections. We're lonelier than ever, more depressed than ever, more attached to our screens than we are the people around us. It's all just a mask to hide up their horrible, depressing, dystopian lives. And this is what's so depressing in Blade Runner. When both Kay and Joy come to embrace on the roof, a call from the boss freezes Joy mid-frame and Kay is forced to answer, confronting the brutal, horrible reality that is his life, where his boss demands that Kay come back to the office immediately as they found something. Once he's there, Kay is shown the contents of the box, which turns out to be a coffin. A woman's body has been found and it's decades old. At first, it looks like the farmer murdered her, but it's just not the case. Instead, she died in childbirth, which becomes all the more shocking when we learn that she's also a replicant. Now, replicants are meant to give birth, but somehow in a miraculous turn of events, she had anyway. And as Kay's boss says, this will break the world as they know it. Learning that replicants can also create life would break the final barriers between them and human beings, forcing the world to come to terms with its gross treatment of sentient life. But all of this can be avoided if Kay hides up the evidence and finds the child as soon as possible. And this setup brings us to Kay's overall quest in his journey, to find the mystery behind this child. This is Kay's program purpose, so Kay goes to look up the genetic file of the baby, but just as he finds it, he's greeted by a new character called Love. Now Love is also a replicant, and works for Wallace, the shadowy figure behind all of the new replicants, the hidden technocrat running society. Love does give him some info, but it's all fractured and muddled. You've got a little boy, he shows you his butterfly collection, lost the kill jar. I take him to the doctor. But eventually he gets the name Deckard from a recording that was made. And using this info, Kay talks to an old colleague of Deckard's, who also gives him cryptic information. Love, who is updating Wallace on what happened. Now Wallace is a crazed megalomaniac, comparing himself to God. He's the hidden elite, the top 0.01%. And behind his virtuous veneer, Wallace has very dark plans for the future. He hopes to create replicants that can give birth so that he can create a self-replicating population of slave labour for humanity's expansion. And he's created a new model of replicants, but still hasn't unlocked the secrets. And in a grotesque display of power and cruelty, 
difficulty, he bursts one of the new models then kills it. As lives mean nothing to him, it's all about more power and more greed. And all of the people around Wallace are programmed to love and obey him. They have no choice. And that's when Wallace reveals that he knows about the replicant child and tasks love to find them as well. But Wallace isn't just the main antagonist for Kay though, he represents a much larger and more expansive force at work in society. Now the habitus is a concept derived by sociologists to explain how society molds people. When someone is born, they are merely subject to the attitudes and viewpoints of the people around them. This process of absorption turns them into a reflection of this process and the values that have been instilled within them. But when a society degenerates and people feel no connection to the society around them, it also feeds into this process. Acts of isolation, violence, sexual deviancy build up until eventually the habitus has been changed twisted by the values that are false and detrimental to the people within it. And that's why Wallace exists as a personification of this twisted dystopian habitus, forcing people into roles that are predetermined, roles that are corrupted at the core. And this has the same effect in Blade Runner as our own world. People are unable to find meaning without proper guidance how to live authentically. We look up to false idols, self-help gurus, and any quick fix for our purposeless lives. With our society forcing people into roles they never really wanted, but were pushed into this horrible isolating box, inevitably leading to loneliness and despair, as people search for some hidden meaning but are unable to ever find it because they can never see outside of the box they live in. But there's a problem for Wallace and the Habitus. Eventually they will die. Eventually society will change. And when that happens, both the Habitus and Wallace will be unable to force their own will on replicants and society as a whole. So Wallace searches for a replicant that can give birth. And if he can achieve this, then he will gain mastery over people's free will and purpose forever. And so the child that Kay is searching for will in fact unlock this hidden secret. And so the race is on and Love hires some replicant prostitutes to get whatever information they can out of Kay. So three of them walk over to him whilst he's looking at the pictures and they catch a quick glance before he notices. Two of them back off when they realize that Kay is a Blade Runner, but the third one strikes up a conversation, and it's clear within this short conversation that Kay's loneliness is at the forefront. Oh, you don't even smile. The K is an incredibly lonely man. He's been desensitized by his perfect AI girlfriend, just like adult entertainment does with so many men today. And this has shut him off from the real authentic world. By this point in the story, K is at a dead end in his search. He has no idea what to do. So he goes back to the farm where they found the body. And there he finds a secret compartment with a single sock hidden away, as well as a date carved on a tree. Now the date eerily matches one of K's memories that he believes were implanted into him artificially. But after talking to Joy, a dangerous possibility is made much more clear. The memory could actually be real. And this would mean that Kay would be the special child that everyone's been searching for. And this is massive news for Kay and is a key piece in his heroic journey, because so far his life has been almost meaningless, or at least lacking any authentic goals or purpose. But now Kay has stumbled down a rabbit hole that could confirm his meaning and place in the world. Now philosophers have talked about meaning in lots of different ways for centuries, but one of the most prominent modern western philosophers to gain attention for their theories was Schopenhauer. He saw people were being fitted into predetermined roles by society. Without the freedom to escape from the roles, they're forced to live out their lives in service, toiling away at labor that they have no connection to, isolated from the product or motive, and no sense of attachment to their work. And this forces people to ask the questions of where the meaning of life comes from. And in both the world of the Blade Runner and our world today, this seems to be an increasingly pressing problem. And in Blade Runner, this analogy is literal. Replicants are designed for and made to fulfill roles that don't give them any fulfillment or purpose, but to fulfill their slave master. And the same is true in the real world, though not in such a literal sense. Even if technology hasn't stripped people of free will like in Blade Runner, it still put them in a box, where we're forced to toil away for a system made up of billions of people, a system that's almost too large to notice or care about the individuals it's made up. But in finding out that he might be the mythical child of a replicant, Kay has been given a glimpse of light, a chance to escape his meaningless existence. With the film showing that there is a way out of Schopenhauer's pessimistic view of the world, and Kay is going to do everything he can to hold onto this hope. So Kay goes back to his place where he had the memory linked to the date, and what he finds only confirms his belief. The same wooden toy in his memory that he thought was fake is still there, and once he's retrieved it, Kay is hit by the realization that he is special, and that he has a higher purpose to work towards, which is only reinforced by Joy, who gives him a real name. And to confirm this theory even further, Further, K goes to check whether his memory is an implant or not. To do this, he heads to a specialized lab where the woman responsible for creating replicant memories lives. She's immunocompromised, meaning that she can't leave her room and has been there as a child. So she watches K's memory with tears in her eyes and tells him that it's all real. What he remembered really did happen, and his life really does have a greater meaning. Up until this point, K had been holding in all of his emotions, but when K learns that his memory is actually real, it's all too much. It means that he is the replicant child and that his life as a Blade Runner is all a lie. And this knowledge is all too much for Kay, who lets out years of raw, pent up emotion in one short outburst. Dad! Dad! 
all the loneliness, the sacrifices, the false mission his whole life was built around. And soon after leaving the lab, Kay is promptly arrested, where he's taken in by his boss and is subjugated to the emotion tracking baseline test. Kay predictably fails, but saves his own life by lying to his boss that he found the child and killed them. She lets him go and Kay heads home to see Joy. But when he gets home, Joy has a surprise for him. She has hired the prostitute from earlier to sync with her, also that she can experience real love making with Kay. And even though technology looks close to the real thing, it still hasn't cleared the unbridgeable gap. It's all a lie. It's just another form of instant gratification that's holding Kay's life down, all for the benefit of the powerful few. And so just before the prostitute leaves, she places a tracker on Kay so that Wallace can follow him. And suddenly Kay is on a timer. He knows the authorities are tracking him down. And before he leaves, he transfers Joy to the portable device and erases her from the house so that her memories can't be mined for information on Kay. This means she's tied to the vice. If it's destroyed, then she will die with it. Love then shows up to the apartment shortly after and finds out that they've disappeared. Meanwhile, Kay finds out that the wooden toy he found was from Las Vegas, which is now an eradicated wasteland. Love next goes to see Kay's boss, but kills her when she tells him that Kay killed the child as nowhere to be found. And after hacking into the computer system using her dead body, Love learns that Kay is in Las Vegas, but Kay is still ahead of her and makes his way to the ruined city, where he finds Deckard, who Kay now believes is his father, where they talk and discuss the mother of the child, a replicant called Rachel. But before they go any deeper into the discussion, Love shows up with backup, kidnapping Deckard and leaving Kay for dead, who is heavily wounded. But not before Love kills Joy by stepping on her portable device, killing the only strand of his past life. Kay is now completely alone, although is luckily rescued and taken in by a shadowy secret society of replicants. The woman who planted the tracker earlier is there to welcome him, where they tell Kay about their plans to rebel against humanity and free themselves of Wallace and the government's control. They even tell him to kill Deckard to stop Wallace learning about the child. But what's more important for Kay is the information they have for him. Rachel had a daughter, not a son, which means that Kay isn't the chosen one. The memories he had were implants from the real girl. Kay doesn't have a predetermined higher goal to strive towards. It was all a facade. Instead, he's only one person in the world and his whole journey up until this point has only been meaningful insofar as it helped other people on their journeys. His life has been meaningless for himself. He has been a slave. And this realization breaks Kay down. It's the total reverse and what his whole journey was about. But this doesn't just represent the end of Kay's journey, it also means the end of his world, his identity, who he is. Kay's meaning has been founded on the belief that he is special, that he matters for reasons completely outside of his control. But without this foundation to structure his identity off of, Kay's world is crashing down. He's even lost joy his only companion in life. So as Kay steps outside, we're treated to one of the most powerful scenes in the movie, where a massive hologram of Joy appears in front of Kay, telling him that she can help with his deep-seated loneliness. But this isn't actually Kay's Joy, this is just an advertisement. But even without knowing anything about him, the hologram calls Kay Joe, only further confirming the feeling that Kay's life has been built on lies. Joy's love for him, and even what she said in their most intimate moments were all designed and created by someone else. It was all fake from the beginning, and this one realization drives home Schopenhauer's pessimistic view of meaning. The only thing that has meaning is the struggle to exist. Schopenhauer calls this the will. It's simply the spirit and people that keeps them moving forward. Surviving is the only goal for the will, and once you die, there isn't any way to know what your life was like. All the singular moments that made up your life will vanish. And the philosophy of Blade Runner goes way beyond this. For thousands of years, people have grappled with the idea that without a higher source of meaning, there are only the struggles of life. In Buddhism, this makes up the first two parts of the Four Noble Truths. Life is suffering and the path to suffering is what Schopenhauer called the will. Buddhism then teaches us that we need to rise above the will altogether. But Nietzsche also spent years on this very same question and came to a different conclusion. Whilst we can't find meaning outside of ourselves, it doesn't mean that we can't create it. The will, the process of striving towards something, isn't a futile struggle because it has no meaningful end purpose. Instead, a psychologically strong person can change the world around them, creating meaning out of the choices that are laid before them. It takes courage to stand into the abyss of life and create something worth caring about. This is the meaning of life, to create create it yourself. The more meaning you can create through your actions, the stronger that you are. And in our modern world, this is even harder than it was before, with people's value systems and the habits being completely fractured. It gets harder and harder to discover what's actually truly valuable and meaningful in your own life, because there is no set purpose anymore. It's all twisted for someone else's gain. And as technology progresses, it makes the distractions and replacements all the more enticing. But these are just dead ends, empty of meaning. All of this also leads to crushing loneliness, as people are isolated by their world from the people around them. And the world of Blade Runner is almost a dystopian 
dystopian prediction of the future, where all the faults of today are maximized to the fullest. But even in this barren future, Kay still has the strength to find meaning, as we'll soon find out. At first it seemed like Kay is going to kill Deckard, falling into yet another predetermined role, with Kay going out of his way to ambush Deckard's convoy, shooting down the other hover cars and forcing Deckard's car to land. But instead of just killing Deckard, Kay tries to save him. He fights Love in a long and intense battle, with both of them being gravely wounded. But even after getting stabbed multiple times, Kay overpowers Love and pulls Deckard out of the sunken wreck, only narrowly saving him from drowning. For the first time ever, Kay isn't on some predestined path laid out before him. This time, it's real. His purpose is authentic, and his decisions are entirely his own. So when he saves Deckard, Kay creates a meaning for his journey. He fulfills his heroic path, and by this time he has figured out who is really the replicant child. It is the scientist that worked at the memory lab. Her tears were never for Kay, but because she was seeing her own memory. And when Kay brings Deckard to see his daughter, the journey is complete. All of his struggle and loss and suffering have reunited the child and their father. And it's in this act that Kay finally feels fulfilled. He's discovered the meaning he's always been searching for, and in a bittersweet ending, Kay succumbs to his wounds. But at the end of his life, he finally got to understand what it's like to live for something real. And that's why Blade Runner is such a massive movie. And of course, lots of its details and themes are left out to interpretation. But what is very clear is its ability to give us a window into our modern world. The purpose, the loneliness, the meaning of our place in modern society. Which is why the questions that Blade Runner asks are integral to understanding our place in the world. And as time passes by, the message of the film will only become more and more important.